Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Ruby Rogues episode. Today on our panel, we have Catherine Myers. Hey, hey. David Richards. Hello. We have Eric Berry, but he is on a phone call right now. And we have a very special guest today. And it is Olivier Lacan. Salut. And I know I probably didn't do that perfect, but... You did that well. <laughs> All right, great. So, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Well, I'm French, as you can tell by the name. Uh, originally, I was a designer, designer, web developer kind of person who became a Rubyist in like 2010-ish around that area when I fell into Ruby tools like SAS and Hamel and company. And I've been working on Code School for the past six years. So that's my main gig. That's what I do. Uh, currently shutting it down, which is a little sad, but it's kind of like a, it was a really, really fun experience. So that's what I've been doing. And I've been doing some open source work and Ruby and Rails contributions and things like that. So you might have seen me at conferences or like opinionated blog posts about we can do this better, things like that. Cool. Kevin? I just want to say thank you for code school. <laughs> yeah. just I that. definitely you used that a lot when I <laughs> when I first learned how to code. Yeah, you'll feel you'll feel worse about me when I tell you that in twenty seven days or I don't know, seventeen days we're shutting it down sadly. But oh. you know, enjoy it while while it lasts. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't code school uh, part of Pluralsight, or am I thinking of the wrong code school? No, that's the right one. So we were we were acquired by Pluralsight in early 2015. And basically since then, we've been kind of like integrating slowly. We took our time integrating some of the, the features that were made code school really good. Things like interactive courses where you, you know, code in the browser. Uh, more recently, interactive projects um, where you basically go through steps, step-by-step instructions to build something. Uh, into Pluralsight, which actually is part of that. The reason we're shutting it down is because there's a spinoff. Basically, these these two features are going to show up on Pluralsight.com for people who use CodeSchool as free users or paid existing customers are going to have access to that on Pluralsight. There's going to be fewer things there, but uh, the courses are going to build up there, basically. So we're transferring some of that cool knowledge that we've or expertise we had to Pluralsight.com. Cool. Well, you know, at least it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a bittersweet, but a good ending, not like a shutdown. So, uh, you know, that's really cool for you guys. So what are you planning on doing afterwards? That, well, I'm trying to figure out. First of all, we have to clean up the house because it's like shutting something down. I hate the word sunset. Like we had conversations at RailsCon <laughs> with people. Sunset. The, th- the thing I kept saying, I gave a talk about this very topic called uh, life and death of a, the life and death of a Rails app. You can probably find it on speaker deck or probably the video will show up soon. But it's basically the word sunset implies to me that the sunset comes back. Like the sun comes back the next day. When you sunset (laughs) a thing, it doesn't come back around in 24 hours or in like a few months or something. No, it's gone. We're shooting it. It's dead. Uh, Thankfully, we we extracted the best organs before we were (laughs) killing it. I know that's disgusting. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, no, that makes me happy that you know some of the some of the good people who worked on Code School are still working at Plural Site and doing really really interesting stuff in the realm of deeply uh, compelling immersive learning. And there's also some really really cool stuff that we saw internally at Plural Site that, that we're all working on to uh, to find alternative modes of learning, not just like watching stuff, doing stuff with your hands when you're practicing, or just like step by step stuff. There's they're they're working on some really interesting like new ways to find engaging content to teach you stuff. 
Cool. It sounds like you want to change sunset to autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> or organ harvesting. Yeah. Organ harvesting. <laughs> I, I was going down the road of Frankenstein's monster at midnight. I don't know. I like, well, I'm that, like I'm you'll not. see that on June 1st. You'll see if we come out like Urgh, <laughs> looking. And then you guys will be rails for zombies or rails on zombies or <laughs> I guess that's on theme though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Zombies take two <laughs> or three or whatever. Yeah, it's probably three by now. Yeah. <laughs> so today we were uh, bringing you on to the show to talk about package managers. So, uh, do you want to tell us a bit about what a package manager is and where you may have seen it in your day to day development? So I actually studied for this and I listened to an old episode <laughs> of the Ruby Rogues podcast about, uh, about uh, not Bundler, but Ruby Gems with um, Eric Hodel. That's like one of the earlier, I think it's 100 and something. So it's years ago. But I remember listening to that show, driving to Miami for a RubyConf once. And what was really cool is that he basically gave me the answer to this question you're asking, which is we used to have, at least in the Ruby community, reusable code. So things that are solved by someone that they want to share with other people, either because they're incredibly kind or just because it's just a convenient thing to do. So say password management, account management, uh, authentication, things like that, or just like uh, profile, like some, some things like Gravatar integrations once like was a very, very popular thing. So you want to share those and you want to stop having to rewrite them. So you, what you do is you write a file which has that behavior. The tricky thing is like when you, when you move that file to something else, there's no connection between the original document, the, the original library or file that you created, that Ruby JavaScript file, and, uh, and the thing that's going to evolve later, like if you fix a bug or there's a security issue. So how do you notify users that there's an update? So Packager is basically the idea is that you take a piece of shareable code or shareable functionality, not just a one single file, and you just package it into a self-contained unit that can then be versioned and maintained and open source, you know, contributions can be made to it. Security releases can be made. So you tell people, hey, stop using this horrible version that uh, we told you to use a, a year or two ago or five years ago. Uh, so the process becomes way more um, organized and structured in a way that, that is more sustainable, I think. And that's why I think most developer communities that are built around languages or frameworks they tend to evolve kind of in the same problem space. They start solving security problems and versioning problems and, uh, and other things like that, dependencies. It, it seems like around package managers, at least what I've seen is that uh, it seems that when there are problems, it, it, it elevates the conversation too. Um, so, so like having a package manager like this, uh, we've got a problem in the Python world right now where, uh, oh, I don't know if I want to name names, but there's a... a <laughs> There's a package that they're using. They're they're trying to get off of version. They're trying to get into version one, and I think that they're on 0.9 with five or seven nines. And there's just problem, but it elevates the conversation. It's like okay, so now we're trying to deal with this, and now we actually have something we're trying to figure out, and we've got to coordinate it. So having a package ma manager seems to change the conversation, which seems powerful. At least I've seen that from time to time. Yeah, it, it, I think it, it also helps the community kind of mature. Um, the, the kind of conversations I could see about old time Rubyist, for instance, is that you know, there's lots of moving fast and breaking things. Like you pass that script around, you have, I, I think before Ruby Gems, for instance, there was a thing called setup.rb that's mentioned by Eric on that show, which is basically a bootstrapping script, but it's just a drop in thing. So when do you fix the installer? How do you do it? it? It becomes an infrastructure problem that some people just swoop in to fix. So there's a, a ton of really, really good uh, people. I think Chad Fowler was involved in, in that in the Ruby community. It's just at, at a conference, like a, a few people got together and decided, okay, this is untenable. Let's fix this, which I think is a beautiful thing that happens in package managers and in, in broader, bigger communities, I guess, uh, like Linux. Package managers are a huge, complicated topic. Like there's multiple names for every package manager. It's very confusing. And that's one thing that I, I focus on a lot, be, probably because of, of the work I've done at Code School, which is always faced with not necessarily beginners, but people who are switching technologies. They're entering a new technology space with the existing knowledge of general web development stuff, but they don't know, okay, how do you do this in Python? 
how do you do this in JavaScript and, and, and Elm and something like that? Like, how is it different? And that's often when you see a lot of potholes that people just put a, a piece of wood on top of, and then you roll through and you know, the wood shatters and then you get stuck. And that's, uh, that's what I love to try to fix, at least in the community I'm home in, which is Ruby. But in general, I think it helps smooth over um, just new be- beginner or just newcomers to community experiences where the package manager is a really nice experience. You can find packages, you can find popular and like reliable packages easily. Uh, you can upgrade and, and security is also not as much of a concern, although that's really tricky to deal with. You know, I, I, to emphasize what you just said, I, I uh, created a new virtual environment this morning and um, I was setting up just some um, in Python and just setting up, I think I had five or six main libraries I was loading. And I was just curious, you know, what did I just do? So it was a <laughs> brand new environment and like how many packages did I just bring in? You know, it's about 40 or 50. I'm like, wow. You know, the, the, the complexity just works sometimes when it, when there's people like you that are willing to contribute and keep the packages clean <laughs> and handle problems when they come up. But it's, it's pretty easy for me to take, take that for granted of, of just how much complexity we, we, we handle well that way. It's interesting that you bring that up. I don't know if anyone wants to shame it, but like it's, it's very different across communities. What's acceptable as a, a bundle of dependencies on the, in the JavaScript community, for instance, is way higher than in the Ruby community, which is way higher than <laughs> in many other communities. Like just when you see people's gem files, like bundler and Ruby gems, like dependencies and transitive dependencies, uh, there, there's tons of cultural differences there. Well, I think Ruby and Rails gives us so much already that we don't need to reach into so many gems that other languages do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for JavaScript, it's just whatever you have installed on your computer, that can be a dependency. No questions asked, right? <laughs> I don't know if it's a joke or if it's real. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know with JavaScript, the desperation, or is it just a truthful <laughs> statement? <laughs> you know, whenever I go to install a JavaScript package, it's like the number of dependencies, it just seems ungodly high. It feels like there's the cultural difference is also where the seams are for like packages, like in, in Ruby that you integrate a lot more functionality into one Ruby gem than you perhaps might in an, an NPM or yarn package or something like that. It feels like, I don't know why it might just be an architectural, like uh, artifact of, well, that's a weird sentence uh, of, of just the way that the zeitgeist of the community decided, okay, we're going to break things out and have dependency injection, everything. And I don't know. Yeah. You know, whenever I start a um, new rails application with Webpacker, just that uh, the nodes module folder it's just insanely large. It takes forever to scroll through or find the actual package that I yarn added. I'm like, geez, this is just unbearable. Yeah. I mean, people, people from the early days of other communities always have, you can, I didn't start out early in, in almost any community. I was just like, I became a, a, a programmer later. Uh, and you can tell that uh, people became more sensitive to that when they were around for a long time. It's kind of like people who had a modem. They're like, you have so much bandwidth. What do you need that for? Video calls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is interesting too, because if, if you don't know different, you know, if, if somebody just broke into web programming and they pick up JavaScript, they're, that's just, they're normal, Right. And it's hard. It's been hard for me to have a uh, a collaborative conversation about that because it's not that I want to necessarily change it, but at some point, some Node projects or some JavaScript problems they they can get really hairy, and so it's really hard to try to think it through and and and, and do it in a, a constructive way. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, Yarn just runs, and whatever the community does, that's what we do, and that's okay, I guess. But it is a completely different perspective. Um, of what people are trying to accomplish and how they're trying to accomplish it. <laughs> he says vaguely as he, as he ponders his navel <laughs> thinking about, but yeah, you know, I, I, I had a project once where I put in, I was trying to get something out quickly and I wasn't being very careful and uh, I don't do a lot of UI. I'm usually in the back end, mm-hmm. And so I grabbed all these packages and then within a few months with the dependencies, um, I, I, I couldn't, 
I didn't have a safe, a safe environment anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't rebuild my dependencies correctly. And um, so I had to actually scrap a lot of work and, and rebuild a few pieces. Sure. So, you know, in the JavaScript world, I think things happen so quickly and there's a lot of innovation that's happening there right now. And so it's really hard to, for, for a mind like mine to, to kind of grasp it and, and be productive with it because people are solving problems in a, in a, in a way that I probably don't, you know, that's not the way I naturally think, I guess, you know, that yeah. they broke down things small and, and uh, go fast. And, and, and there's also a lot more surface area, you know, when they have that many dependencies, there's just a lot of surface area of things that they're solving. And like, why I don't even have time to even think about what you're thinking about. So, and I think when you're trying to use all of these different packages, the dependencies is where you can really get into trouble the fastest way. Uh, so, Olivier, how would you go about? Okay, you've got a dependency problem. How would you go about attacking that? That's so. I, I've thought about this a lot because my job for the last three years has been to maintain and deal with dependencies that were either set up by early developers like myself on a, on a startup. So lots of fast like iterations and things like that. And you end up taking on dependencies that you don't fully comprehend and uh, transitive dependencies you don't even know about. So um, things like um, authentication, for instance, like there's a lot of very hard to fix, mis- not mistakes, but decisions that are hard to change away from. Uh, we, we did a, uh, not a QR code, but a, a two-factor authentication implementation that was only for administrators just to protect our admin accounts and things like that. And it was a, um, it was a one-step process. So it was one of those things where you have to have the QR, not the QR code, the two-factor token on the, on the window when you type in your password, which doesn't really work with password managers often. Like one password gives you the, the two-factor authentication token and expects it to be after the sign-in screen. You sign in and then it asks you. So there's lots of things like that. There's just, why is it like that? And you look into the gem and the dependency or the, the package and you're like, oh, it's because it's using this other dependency that requires that to happen in this fashion. Or it has an integration with device, which has strategies that work in a certain way and that ha- are stackable. So you either you replace the strategy entirely, uh, two-factor authentic- authenticatable, I think is the one, or you just patch it. You just put it in, in front of before. So like managing those things often involved for me be- loading in my brain, <laughs> what did we take on? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like buying a house and realizing like all the intricacies of the maintenance you have to do around the house all of the like loan that loan consolidation things that you can all the options you can do that you'd never explored because it's just your brain would explode if you just considered all of your transitive dependencies at once mm-hmm. you can only like kind of like hub and spoke like go into one narrow well of <laughs> dependencies and just go okay well so it depends on this thing no one maintains this thing okay i have a liability there so I, I think of dependencies are uh, just like degrees of liabilities. You could almost like purchase insurance against your dependencies. That'd be fun. Like yeah. a Geico quote for your, um, so I'm not, I'm not shilling for Geico, but like uh, 15 minutes or less, you know how much risk you're taking on dependencies. But it, there's so much of that. We take on risk because it's, it's free and easy to take on the risk. And, and it, it feels like maybe the right thing to do when you're a beginner, like, of course, don't reinvent a wheel. You, you hear that so many times. I think that, uh, I think David, you were mentioning that, like you were fixing problems you had with dependencies by just replacing them basically, which is exactly the kind of stuff that I did for years at Code School where I was like, we use this gratuitous gem that's not maintained and now I can't change it or I have to figure out a way to like vendorize it and you know, override its thing or patch it locally. <laughs> And you end up in situations like a lot of bigger companies that have grown really fast where you're stuck with your patches and you can't yes. frameworks. And yes. uh, a really, really great talk from Eileen Yushitel at, at uh, RailsConf about like GitHub doing that a lot. And you're like, well, if GitHub does it, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can do it too. <laughs> it's, yeah. you know, a lot of that was inspecting those transitive dependencies is realizing, for instance, all the myriad ways in which we, we patched device at the time where device didn't do things we needed it to do. And then features get released and you lose track of the, uh, the feature releases or worse, uh, it's a personal topic, there's no change log. And so you have no <laughs> idea what's in the new release unless you literally scroll through every issue, every commit, 
or a horrible commit dump that has typos and is unlegible for a human being, things like that. Well, I think having a problem with your dependencies is the best way to learn how to jump into source code. Yes. You know, you have to jump into this unknown code base and figure out what's going on. But yeah, I've definitely been on the receiving end of of trying to figure out how to update something that's been forked or patched. And Mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's it's yeah. how I also f- became comfortable with with contributing to anything. It was just like after just months and years of reading through code that I thought was brilliant, and then I read it, <laughs> and then I was like, "Oh, these people are like God Normal. sending from Olympus, like gifting us with their packages that just do things, and I don't have to do anything." And I would read the code and be like, "Oh my God, this is all holding with like duct tape and like <laughs> uh, staples." It's just normal people. <laughs> yep, exactly. And they're nice. That's the other thing. Most of them are nice. Well, and you know, sometimes you can paint yourself into a corner by trying to roll roll your own homebrewed version of that feature without knowing the intricate details of what all goes into this domain. And you know, I've seen some people, you know, to say on your example of the one-time password or multi-factor authentication, where they made the multi-factor authentication uh, text box part of the password field. So you type in your password and then you type in your one-time code as part of one string of your password. And I'm like, that's such a horrible implementation. <laughs> what could go what? wrong? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that's exactly another reason why I remember early on, everybody went devise for a few years when I, I was becoming more more experienced people were like device was de facto solution. There was a few alternatives uh, that are interesting, but a lot of people had learned device or for, for Ruby and Rails specifically uh, to do authentication and user accounts and stuff like that and resetting passwords, all these little details like that, that seem like you could reproduce them and then you do it. And I have for a lot of internal tools that we use at Code School where I just was like, okay, I'm taking this for granted. Let's just build a device that's simpler. That's just like uses OAuth only and there's no passwords and anything like that. And it's simple, but also it's not necessarily secure and you will not know when it's not because no one's poking at your you know, little wheelbarrow solution uh, to see if there's flaws for it until someone breaks in and it's too late and there's no like community awareness of it. So I've seen a lot of the people kind of coming back to like popular um, de facto packages that people use and be like, well, everybody uses this. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of boring. I'm going to try this other thing or I'm going to build my own. And then you, you ignore a gigantic other liability, which is the world of vulnerabilities and, and subtle bugs that you're not aware of. Like for my solution, I had a bug where if you signed in with a certain kind of Google account, it would do a redirect loop forever. And no one told me because it was an internal tool. So there was no like reporting channel for like, oh, I can't sign into the documentation tool. And this is horrible. I just was going to stop using it. So I noticed that I saw the artifact of my bad maintainership of my internal tool, basically. Whereas in public open source, you definitely will hear about it if it's broken. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, then you have the public open source programs that, you know, hopefully everyone does their due diligence and at least glimpse at the source code to see kind of what it's doing to weigh the option. Is this even needed? You know, can I just extract that code, put it in my app in its own little service library or something? But uh, vulnerabilities introduced into your application through a gem or some other kind of package. Like I think a few years ago, there was one with a Rails Assets Angular, which injected in, um, uh, this is in a Rails app alert. So on a lot of pages, it would just pop that up and you know, someone had submitted a bug uh, to say, hey, can we remove this from Ruby gems? You know, that's a very uninvasive, but kind of invasive alert. You know, it's just an alert, so it's not damaging. Right. But the amount of damage that someone could do with releasing a gem and it becoming popular, you know, you hear on the Google Play Store where uh, uh, Apple get released, it gets millions of downloads, but it's actually malicious. Mm-hmm. But the community uh, just saw the name, saw the picture, 
trusted it, and then downloaded and installed it. And they had a lot of malicious content mining uh, cryptocurrencies on your phone. Yeah. And because it had the popularity of number of downloads, people instantly trusted, oh, this has to be legit. So I think that there is responsibility on uh, our part. You know, you can take the chance or risk to not review the code if it's open source. But to just see, you know, what is this gem or package actually doing? You know, that's kind of, you know, leads into my problem with um, NPM or uh, Ruby gems where anyone can push anything. There is no accountability. So we could run into those malicious situations. Has that happened in the past with Ruby gems? Yes. It yes. happened. Uh, there was basically a malicious gem that was pushed that um, exploited a vulnerability in rubygems.org, I think, hmm. to access uh, other gems or access the storage mechanism for other gems. I think it was. I think it was a YAML vulnerability that was exploited because there's a YAML file inside a Ruby gem that was that was or is generated still. So it was parsed. There was code that just you know, uh, could allow you to remotely execute some code and stuff like that. So that was swiftly patched. And then there was a, a thorough review, I think it was 2013 or something, a thorough review of all of the checksums, like the, the, the actual content of every gem ever to see if any of them had been tempered with and none of them had been. But, you know, it, it, is, it is scary for sure. I think it's a social contract. I think you, you make a deal with the greater community that, uh, that we all look out for each other. And the alternative is Apple, uh, which I like for devices that I carry with me and go to bed with, you know, uh, mm-hmm. put next to my, my bed stand. I, I don't close the laptop and put it there. But Apple has a super strict, super thorough review process that even that one gets, you know, um, flaunted often and they have to backtrack and fix things. Uh, but it's closed and it's very rigid and it's and it requires gigantic money and manpower and resources and things like that to to maintain. Whereas uh, open source is more like, well, we're going to assume that if someone finds a flaw, they'll report it. If uh, you know there's an exploit, someone will find it or do what you said, uh, Dave, where where someone will actually <laughs> look at the source code and it happens. I mean, OpenSSL, for instance, was an example of. There was a mm-hmm. flaw and people were like, hmm, let me look at more code in OpenSSL, which is why you get those like cascading security reports. I get one and then someone's like, hmm, <laughs> I haven't looked at that code in a while. I should probably look at the other things that they're doing wrong. Oh my God, there's 50 <laughs> like that. I kind of like that process. I think it's nice because it's, it's not just whenever resources are allocated by a big company to take care of it. Um, it's just... It's kind of like randomized routing versus like intelligent routing. Like eventually it'll go wrong. I don't know. There's bad metaphor. <laughs> when you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks, and VPNs. Plus, they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code RubyRogues2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code, again, is RubyRogues2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available positions. Well, then you have pioneer companies like ThoughtBot who have been amazing to the community. And with their uh, deprecation of the paperclip gem, you know, that stirred up a whole bunch of drama around uh, that community because uh, some people were like, you owe us an explanation as to why you are doing this. And I think that a lot of people forget that just like I am and you guys are, we are um, uh, people too. 
So we have to maintain this gym or we have to maintain these things. And sometimes life gets the better of us and we don't have time to do it. Or something else comes out that's going to be in the future, near future, whatever, the more standard de facto preferred way of doing it. And so it makes sense to deprecate it your gym over time. And I think there's good ways and bad ways to handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe just closing it straight up to it's no longer available wouldn't be the best way, but to just put it in the readme file saying like, Hey, we're deprecating this. We're going to stop development on it. If you want to take over it, you know, feel free, but we're doing this in favor of active storage or shrine or whatever other upload or gym there is. I kind of want to read from the MIT license really briefly because it sounds like a super fun. <laughs> the software is provided as is, without warranty of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to the warranties of merchantability, blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> it is provided as is. We are all agreeing that we are holding hands kind of like in a kumbaya circle and saying like, we're going to take care of this if someone like drops it. So one thing that could happen is someone can fork paperclip. And then yeah. start working on it. It's happened countless times. Consultancies that were building software in the early days of the Ruby communities or even the middle days, they just became like too busy to, to deal with it. They just passed it on to other communities or it became a community-focused organization. Like it happened to Capybara. It happened to Poltergeist. It happened to... Ken Ken. Yeah, exactly. Or people yeah, just they, dropped off. Ken Ken had, Ken. Yeah, burnout happened and things like that. So if it doesn't happen to a company that is sponsoring open source, it might happen to an individual who's like, I'm kind of over this. Like I have three kids and I want to take care of my kids rather than work on weekends. I, I've heard that tune. I'm sure all of us have heard that tune or felt that even for work. Like you just want to move on sometimes. And that's where I think necessity is the parent of invention there. You know, if a big company is really depending on that package, then that's when they have to make a choice. Okay, are they going to start making pull requests and or are they going to take over that or figure out something different? But I've definitely had at our company at Maven Link where we need something changed. So we made our own pull request. And mm -hmm. so we're going to give back to the community, mostly out of, you know, hey, goodness as well, but we need it to work. And yeah. Yeah. I had the same and, issue with that. Uh, oh, sorry. You know, the alternative to that is you can always just fork it, make your own changes, star the parent repository for any changes they're making, and then merge them into your local branch with the changes that you need. Like, no one's forcing you to rely on other people. You know, we're all given the same source code base that we can work off of. You know, it's a matter of time and it's a commitment to do, but um, to say that someone owes someone something, you know, in the open source community, I think is a bit silly. Yeah. Um, you know, if yeah, you, we have to get rid of that sense of entitlement. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> that's true. Well, you know, it's it's interesting though. It seems like we're talking about the um, the unstated part. Whenever somebody says, "Man, I love the community," uh -huh. you know, and they'll talk about whatever community they're in, Ruby or JavaScript or whatever, and it and it really is this social contract, the way we get things done, who gets things done whether we can trust it, you know? And, I, and I, so it's like that unstated thing that basically says, if I'm going to use this technology, I'm trading my reputation and time to work with you. And, you know, somebody's going to depend on me, a company or whatever product needs to work. And so it's like this weird tension. And then of course, you know, yeah, that's a sense of entitlement and they go too far to say you owe me, but it, it is a really interesting thing that, Collectively, we built something <laughs> with a lot of unstated value and, and how it really works and, and whether it work, really works. And um, yeah, people need to get over what, what we owe each other. But at the same time, it's like, wow, you know, I, I love this, <laughs> this idea of, uh, you know, this risk, this, you know, this insurance against risk. You know, there's a lot of inherent risk to the, the systems we use. And it's, it's a deep a deep tree, a deep well, a deep something. Something's, mm -hmm. there's a lot there. Yeah, there's a, a philosophical reason for me. Um, the reason I'm part of the Ruby community is not because it's the uh, fad. It, I mean, maybe it's how I became aware of it because it became, you know, part of my attention span. And I was like, ooh, what is this shiny thing? But 
I chose this community based on a set of principles that I see espoused in the way that things are done, in the way that most people hopefully behave with one another, the way that people deal with dependencies and security issues and, 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 and things like that. So the intangible little uh, like um, dark energy, you know, like the, the things you don't see, the mass you can't detect. Like that's the thing that that kind of like attracts me there. You can see it manifested in some ways. Like you you can see the gravitational pull of it in the ways that we decide to deal with dependencies or deprecate things. Or for instance, in Rails, like I don't know, years ago, uh, deprecation in Rails was like a massive headache. And now thanks to the work of, of people like, like Sean Griffin on Active Record, for instance, like there are like millions of really descriptive extremely detailed deprecations uh, that it, it, it's becoming kind of a normal thing to see your gem that you're using say, hey, this, this method you're calling is not going to be available in three versions from now. That's amazing. That's such a, a user-focused, friendly way to say, hey, I know we made this available. We're not going to make it available anymore. Uh, just get ready for that and it will, we'll handhold you and like help you uh, deal with it. And I don't know, this, it's tricky to trust other people, but it's, it's the, the, the trope that everyone says once in a while. It's, just, it's all about people. Uh, and it is. If you, if you choose to trust the dependency, what you're trusting is the people behind that dependency, the people who did that pull request. Like Catherine, you were saying like the pull request you're making implicitly means you're becoming the maintainer of that thing. That's something that I've seen, I think Eric and a bunch of other like Ruby gems or bundler contributors or even Ruby and Rails when they accept your pull request, either they're taking on maintenance burden for you as the maintainer of that feature, or they're saying, I'll accept it, but you're now in charge of this. That's your job now. And uh, I've had people do that for for contribution I did to Rails, which is super minor. It's a tiny little thing. And, and they were like, okay, well, we're not going to make it for you. <laughs> I would have hoped, but uh, we'll guide you through it. And then by the time you're done, you'll know so much. You will. The only option you'll have is to maintain it because now you're the expert. You know how it works, how to test it, why it's different, why it works, and things like that. Hopefully, that's not a deterrent for people making a PR. <laughs> you know, when you have to make the decision: do I fork? Or do I open a PR? Um, I, I mean, it's better for the community if you do open a PR. Mm-hmm. Definitely. The thing I. I'm debating with myself. I don't think I'm going to drop any names. Um, once upon a time, I worked for an organization and I had, um, I worked with several of the, the core Ruby and Rails uh, contributors. And um, I was actually one of their managers. And my job was to make sure that people left him alone so that he could work, you know, work on the Ruby and Rails community. And, and what I loved about that was the amount of work that he did, the amount of maintenance and the, the patience. And, and, and it was not a small thing, you know, I mean, if I'm going to build an application, work in a company, um, the, the complexity that I'm dealing with is, is much smaller than, than what this person was doing. And um, anyway, so I, I guess having seen in the front end, I guess the point I'm trying to do uh, make is, is that, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the people that, that, that make this stuff work, they, uh, they, 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 it takes a lot of patience, a lot of hard work, and then they'll dig throughout the night on, on these obscure issues that, uh, that, that came up that uh, doesn't affect anything that they ever even imagined, you know, just because the, the surface area of these, some of these large packages. And it takes a lot of communication skill as well. When you're responding to those issues and to those PRs, like it, it takes a lot of skill. Yeah. Yeah. And the ability to cut through really quickly to, to figure out what, what, what are we going to do here? You know, cause they really don't have time to sit and chat about it there. There's a lot to do. And so it, it is amazing the burden we put on our open source core contributors. Um, it, it's heroic in the, in the classic sense that they'll, they'll, they give up a piece of themselves for something bigger. Let's and, give them a round of applause. Yay. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everybody. This is Eric. I, hey, this Hi, is Eric. Eric. Hey, sorry I was out. Um, I actually planned on staying out of the conversation just because I'm so late to the game, but you guys are talking about such fun things. I can't help but join. <laughs> FOMO. Uh, 
Got you. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> no, very cool. I agree with you. The uh, open source community really needs to, uh, to to get that boost of morale and the boost of, of support from all of us. And I agree that the very last thing you should do is fork it and start something new. Um, that's just That's just bad juju. So let's not do that. I wonder when that's going to stop. Like a lot of people opine at conferences and places like that about when when the tipping point will happen with JavaScript. That that the reflex is not to create yet another version, uh, not a version, but a, a, another alternative. When did that? Do you any of you remember when that happened in Ruby, like or in other communities? Like w- was there a phase of maturity in which people are like, you know what, I will get more satisfaction, social credit, validation, happiness from just fixing the thing that's already there rather than creating my own special version that's just mine because I'm amazing. I think... I, I uh, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Dave. Oh, I was going to say, I, I don't know if my view was universal enough, but I remember around version two of Ruby where the conversation really turned into business value and that real things are being um, supported with this when we stopped just, we didn't stop, but it started the trend. I think we started the trend of saying, okay, we're collectively going to build the same thing. Um, so that's when I started noticing it was when the conversation around business value and business risk went up, then the conversations around, or the, you know, the forking and, and, and starting something new seemed to go down. Do you guys remember, uh, there used to be a website and, uh, you know, the, with Ruby and with, with the growth of Ruby, we saw a lot of drama throughout the years. Uh, the first point that I significantly remember um, when somebody had, instead of, of updating or helping build a, an existing popular gem, it was actually uh, completely uh, replaced by a different one, is when No Kogiri came in and replaced HPCOT. And then that led to kind of a, a big old uh, storm of, uh, uh, in my view, it led to why the lucky stiff leaving the community. But um, so that, and that was all the way back in what, 2009, 2010. But I remember back in those days when I was getting into Rails, they had uh, a website where you could go like days since last Ruby drama. Do you remember that? Oh, oh that's <laughs> yeah. It's like, how many days have we gone without Ruby drama? <laughs> it's like stuck between 10 and 30 days. I, so I, I understand why this website exists and I'm not like refuting the, the logical like reason for its existence, like rational reason why it exists. The Mm -hmm. thing is that humans have conflict and it's normal and it's good. I would rather have more Ruby drama so we solve problems together than pacify and pretend that we're all fine with each other. I've said earlier, like, there are mostly nice people and there's sometimes nice people are dimwits. They're being selfish. I, I, I do it all the time. I, there's moments where I think I'm doing the right thing and you're standing in my way so... Screw you not merging my pull requests. Like, I know better. No, yeah. I need to get called out once in a while. And there needs to be drama to resolve anything. So I, I really don't, sorry, I don't mean to like rain on this like really hard and dramatize it. Huh? Um, yeah. But <laughs> well, I, I like drama. And as, a, as I guess that's the French Latin thing inside of me. I'm like, yes, get a good yell out. Get it out of your system. And then talk to each other. Keep talking. Yeah. Don't just and there's... Stu. There's definitely a difference between healthy conflict and unconstructive conflict. Absolutely. And just like a marriage, you know, uh, a marriage that never fights isn't going to work. A marriage that never has conflict isn't going to work. You need that communication. You need that conflict sometimes, but it can be a healthy conflict. It doesn't have to be name calling, berating, and belittling one another. But if it's the ultimate goal is to lift each other up and to support one another. You can have good, healthy conflict, just like in the open source community. A gem that is uh, maintained by the users of that gem, if they have problems or if they have issues with how each other's directions are going, that can be resolved in a very respectful and a very healthy manner instead of a lot of name calling and belittling. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. true. You have to learn how to fight. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I wish, I, I, I wish we would do more of that, learning how to fight. You're right. 
I'm thinking about that website, Spurious Correlations or whatever it's called. Cause, cause that's my precursor that I might be completely wrong about this, but I think that there's a, a, a healthy correlation between um, how young or a company is and how loud it gets. You know, the disruptive startups tend to have, I think in my experience, I'm in my 20th startup. I've done a lot of it and we've done a lot of yelling. That's a lot. We've done a lot of just, <laughs> just grunt work and go there, you know, and there was one where, you know, we used to play hacky sack uh, every afternoon just to get the, the tension down. Um, right now, they're a multi-billion dollar public company. You know, like it took hard work to figure out the hard problems. And, and we didn't have time to be nice to each other. Um, we, so I thought that that, but, and, and I don't know if I fought well. I think that if you ask those guys, you know, how did I do? Well, probably he's, you know, not a good name, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, we, 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 we found a way, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, that, that there is some sort of a correlation between trying to find a way and being a healthy community and, and not having to be calling names. And I, I think Dave's absolutely right. You know, I could, I could fight better. I could fight smarter. <laughs> anyway. Well, I, I so I, I recently gave a talk at the Ruby Hack Conference, um, and, and you're and you're touching on a topic that I that I feel pretty strongly about, which is, uh, you know, you're talking about how long do you wait until a maintainer replies or doesn't reply when you fork it or when you start to saying, okay, we're going to take this over. And you got to also take into consideration the point of view of that maintainer. Now there's a difference between a maintainer and a contributor, right? A contributor mm -hmm. is people who are submitting PRs. Maintainer is the guy who has to, or the guy or girl who has to make sure that everything keeps in line with what they imagine the, the, the project should be. And they're typically doing it in their own time for free. And what happens is, is that the more demands that, they get for change, the more it becomes a job, the more they realize, like, I don't like doing this, and then they get burned out. So, so having that empathy for them and understanding where they're coming from, instead of just saying, hey, I'm going to come in and, and uh, fork your stuff, a better approach might be saying, hey, I noticed that you're really having a, a bit of a time keeping up with this. Would you be okay having a co-maintainer on the project where I can help you out and help alleviate some of these pull requests and issues and whatnot? That's probably the best solution. And I, in my view, something that they would prefer to hear versus, you know, hey, if you're not going to do this, we're going to fork it and, and fork you, right? Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so that that's that's my view of that. Yeah, and even if you're too scared of that commitment of becoming a co-maintainer, maybe you can say, "Hey, how about I become a temporary co-maintainer?" Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You just if you just help out, there's no say. Like the the problem is like the self-serving. Usually, when you come in, it's because you need something, right? You need something from that maintainer or that that library. So you're like, okay, well, I need something. Uh, but I want to contribute in a sense, like I want to become like a helper on this thing. Just start helping. That mm -hmm. that doesn't re necessarily require a conversation. You can ask, as you said, Eric, like you can ask, do you need some help? I would even stop at, do you need some help? Rather than just even saying like, it feels like you need a co-maintainer. If I yep. receive that as a maintainer of some open source projects, like they're not very heavily software, but mostly text-based, I'd be like, are you saying that I'm doing a bad job? All right. <laughs> My feelings would be a little like hurt like there, but uh, that's a good point. Potentially. But again, that depends like how tired you are in the workload. Maybe you're, you know, that you have a ton of pull requests backlogged because you were super busy at work, uh, you know, moving fast and making 20 startups. Like that, that might be one of the reasons. Um, yeah, it's tricky to deal with. Mm. Mm -hmm. I had a, I had a thing to, to migrate us from, yes, we're talking about burdens. Uh, so let's add more burdens on the maintainers and specifically not just the maintainers, but the contributors. I think there's uh, a lot of, so I've done this in, at Code School specifically when we built out team functionalities for Code School. I, I added managers to teams so that the, a person could be a manager of a team without having to pay for a seat to have access to content. They could manage the team. They could be basically the HR person that adds people to the team and sees everybody's accounts and everything. When I built that feature, I didn't talk to anybody. I was like, obviously someone needs this and they don't want to have access to content to begin with. So I'm just going to turn it off by default. But the people who would sign up for an account were usually those HR people 
they clicked manager and then they couldn't see anything and they thought the website was broken. The problem I see in the open source community often is people in deep down in the well trying to fix the hard problems get kind of lost in there and they don't see the easy potholes that can be fixed above ground. And often those are user experience potholes. And this is one of the, the reasons why I, I, that's why I, I started the blog post called Why Won't Bundle Update uh, was because I'm a longtime Ruby user, I'm a longtime Rails user and contributor. And, and I didn't, didn't realize I was paving, I, not paving, I was putting a, a piece of wood on top of a pothole every time bundle or bun, the bundle update command would not do what I asked it to do. Bundle, all, bundle update, update, no Kogiri, nothing updated. What, why? Could you, could you at least tell me why you didn't do what I asked you to do? And it seems obvious if you've been used, if you understand the internals of like dependency graph resolution and the fact that it's a graph resolution mechanism that's shared between CocoaPods and RubyGems and, uh, and, and Bundler. Cool, but that's way deep in the well, <laughs> way, way deep. And then to understand that as a newcomer, like, oh, I just asked Rails to update and it, it won't. Sometimes it gives you an error message and it says, oh, well, I'm locked to this specific version. And it'll say, it's sometimes hard to resolve, but you can see, okay, well, there's a strict version dependency that is preventing me from upgrading this thing you're asking me to upgrade. But in my case, it was, I ran on a, a bundle update command on one single thing and it wouldn't update. And I didn't know why. And my usual flow for resolving this is like the experience pothole avoider is, oh, I know there's a pothole there. I'm just going to take a, uh, a slight detour and avoid that pothole by running the gem file, grepping it and looking for the name of that gem that I'm trying to update and see all the version dependencies that it has in other gems. Like see what other gems are requiring, what versions they're requiring of that gem. And I was suddenly it dawned on me, why am I doing this work? This is machine work. This is computer work. And I'm a human being and I want to spend time, you know, producing stuff for humans, not like grepping through files to try to figure out what version it is. So I kind of asked around and there's, there's, uh, uh, Joe Masti had a, a little thing called bundle stats, which gives you a bunch of stats about your dependencies in bundler that tells you like how many dependencies every dependency you have has, which is super good because that helps you kind of like keep track on the liability front when you're taking on dependencies. Uh, you can see like a gem has that you barely use has 50 dependencies. Hmm, maybe the liability burden is a little too heavy on that one. Or you should drop it and replace it like uh, David was saying earlier. Or, uh, you know, so I use the, this gem as a basis to kind of like make a little pull request. And I first I asked Joe uh, to say, hey, do you mind? Uh, he, he mentioned it. And I said, do you mind if I, if I try to, to do a thing that will tell me why this gem won't update when I bundle update. And we figured it out. Uh, I used the code that he was writing. And at the time, I think uh, Andre Arco, who maintains Bundler, was uh, just basically replying on Twitter, if you do a pull request for this on Bundler, I think I might accept it because it seems like a useful feature. And I was like, this is beautiful. This is, I had a problem. I thought, I thought there might be a solution to it. I didn't know how to fix it because I have no expertise in Ruby gems and I, it's, it's a very complicated API and, and things. I didn't have time to solve it. I asked for another open source person's help that was maintaining their own little plugin for Bundler. And then eventually everybody helped each other. We talked and I haven't contributed it to Bundler. Maybe someone who's listening can do that. That'd be awesome. Uh, passing on the baton. But that means that maybe sometime in the future, when you bundle update Nokogiri, uh, instead of just silently not doing anything, it'll be like, I noticed that you have uh, a strict version requirement for this, and I can't update you to 2.5 because you're on one nine something something. Uh, and it'd be really good. And these are the little stuff. So the main point I'm trying to make with this gigantic diatribe is to say, these are tiny little things that take very little work to fix. These are easy, quick hits that are everywhere. They're in NPM, they're in Yarn, they're in... Actually, Yarn is really, really good, but uh, Bundler is also really, really good, but because we know that it's very, very good, we don't try to find the, the quick, like easy, little, smooth, little frustration points we can smooth out and things like that. So uh, <laughs> that's another burden for contributors. I think anybody can look out for that. And if not, contribute, report it, or try to say, hey, this is weird. 
I think that's a great point for anyone looking to contribute for the first time and might be super scared to. There's so much low hanging fruit. There's so much. And I think GitHub even has a label of like great for first time contributors or something like that. And go do it. There's some little stuff out there that you can really help with. And if you can't help, you can ask people like, how do I fix this? I mean, this mm-hmm. is my, my bread and butter in Ruby is I have no idea how to do most C things that are in C Ruby. And I just said, hey, I have an idea for a thing. Is it stupid? A bunch of people say, yeah, it's pretty stupid. Uh, mm-hmm. Others say, oh, well, it's stupid, but it's useful. So let me help you. And mostly that, that's it. Like That's how I got started doing any kind of Ruby bug tracker reporting was just watching other people who know how to do it better and begging them, please, can I have a little bit of your time? <laughs> All right. Is there anything else we want to add? Or So, Olivia, uh, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you on, on the line? So it's always the same handle on Twitter, on my website, and on pretty much everything. It's O-L-I-V-I-E-R-L-A-C-A-N. It's like a song. Uh, on Twitter, on uh, .com is my website uh, where I publish uh, opinions and ideas for things and sometimes like philosophical rants. Uh, Twitter usually is where I talk a lot too much most of the time. And then you can find some conferences, conference talks. Like the, the two I think that are most relevant to this discussion we had were Human Errors at RubyConf, which is on Confreaks, and then soon uh, the, death, the Life and Death of a Rails app, which talks a little bit about dependencies and things like that. Uh, and if you want to help out, I have two open source projects. One is called uh, keepachangelog.com. And it's about dependencies and libraries having a user-focused, user human-readable uh, changelog of notable changes every release they make so that it's easier to know what's changed, removed, broken, fixed in security problems and stuff like that. And um, and I guess that's the, the main one I think I want people who are involved in open source to, to look at. Um, so yeah, that's it. Cool. All right, let's move on to some picks. For you, the listeners of Ruby Rogues, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at lootcrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Uh, Catherine, what picks do you have? All right. So my first pick is a book. Um, I love getting out of my own comfort zone and learning about different things. And ta Coates wrote a book called Between the World and Me a few years ago. And I really think it should be required reading, uh, especially for someone like me as a white person, because it's all about what it's like to be an African-American in America today. And it was so valuable to read. And I think that anyone should read it to gain some empathy about what it's like not to be your race. Um, And on a a similar note, but a lighter note, uh, I also really am excited to watch the next season of Dear White People on Netflix. Um, That's more of a comedy. It's a satirical comedy, but on the same front, it's about a bunch of college, black college students in a white school predominantly, and it is hilarious. So I can't wait to watch that. Cool. And David? Yes, I've got one. I've got one pick today. It's uh, yesterday GitHub came out with their uh, their um, checks, their checks. And what's neat about that is that when you you commit code, you can you can now put hooks in there that will interact with the code, whether or not it's uh, doing what you wanted to do. So with the the scope and scale of all the commits we make, it's nice to have more tools to make sure we're putting in there things we want to put in there. Cool. And Eric? Uh, a couple of them, actually. The first one is uh, 
a company that I always go to for my stickers, uh, Sticker Mule. They are they they do a really good job. And uh, I recently had to rebrand uh, Code Sponsor to Code Fund, and we ordered new stickers for that. And they were, you know, I think they quote you longer than normal because they like to exceed expectation. So they said, you'd have it by this date. And I think I had it like a week earlier and super sharp look. And they always put out great content or a quality, a quality uh, stickers. So uh, the other one, um, since Catherine, you mentioned TV show, I'm going to mention a TV show too. Um, it's, it's, it's rated the scariest show on TV last year. And I, my wife and I were watching, we're like, what the hell? It's called um, The Handmaid's Tale, right? And it is some scary, scary stuff to think like, holy cow, this could happen. And, and my wife made the, uh, the perceptive uh, uh, comment about, you know, it's sad and it's crazy because this actually did happen to the black community. This actually did happen to different, you know, through different holocausts. And, and it, it really, it, 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 that, it literally scared her. It made her kind of panic a little bit that this could happen again. But great show. It is scary, but it's a great show to, to watch. Um, so those are my picks. Yeah, no thanks. I don't like scary stuff. So I'll jump in with the pick. It's a TV show as well, not dark, but it's pretty awesome. Cobra Kai. If you have not seen the original The Karate Kids, this is a continuation of when they're all older. So it still has the uh, Ralph Macchio guy and all the old characters, except for Mr. Miyagi because he's dead now. So sad. Uh, so that's one pick. And the other pick is I recently got my hands on a Oculus Go, uh, the standalone VR headset. And those things are a lot of fun to play around with. I don't see them being wholly practical right now, but they are. It is a really cool little device. It's basically a uh, Oculus uh, gear, the Samsung gear, but with a standalone built-in Android um, device within it. So those are my two picks. Olivier, uh, do you have any picks for us? I do. Uh, we were talking about emotions and uh, people and, and mushy things earlier. And I think uh, a book I started reading recently has been one of those books that you heard about from people and uh, you see in airports, but you think like, oh, well, maybe next time I'll, I'll read it. So it's called Rising Strong by Brene Brown. And it's, it's about basically overcoming challenges, not just in the like, yes, I am invincible. I can do anything and things like that. Just like, like recognizing that you're down, recognizing that you're beat, like beat down on the floor and what strategies you can take to just like feel that and feel better. It's like, you know, a lot of people go through burnout, especially when open source uh, and software in general, because it's so fast paced sometimes that it's kind of like, Mind boggling. So I, I really recommend that book. If you're if you're ever so like wondering that maybe you're missing out some tools to think about yourself better or tools to resolve uh, arguments or disagreements better, uh, this is the kind of stuff that you can read to kind of like um, not hack yourself, but like be more mindful of the way that you're perceived and that you perceive other people. Um, so that's one. Uh, I was trying to think really, really hard if I wanted to do a, a, a computer-related thing, but uh, really, the there's a, a video, and it's because uh, Catherine, you, in, you inspired me. Uh, you're talking about like you know, uh, like not seeing the world from your own eyes and seeing it from a different perspective. So I'm French, and I come from France, where we have single-payer healthcare, and that's a big topic with lots of specific opinions. And I have a friend who I used to live with. His name is Timothy Faust. This is like the least normal pick for someone to, to put there. Timothy is, is someone who's extremely, extremely energetic and has like super strong beliefs that I don't completely align with. But politically, he's far more, he's, he's different from me, but not completely. And he cares deeply about healthcare and health justice. And this is the, the way he talks about it. So there's a little video on YouTube of him talking about What's weird and broken and interesting about the way that Medicare and Medicaid works in the US? And I think it's interesting to see it because when you're wealthy ish, you never really have to think about what it's like to be sick and poor. And I think it's really important in our mostly privileged community of people who make a pretty decent amount of money to think, like, well, if I broke my arms, would I be out of, you know, out, out, out on the street because it cost me too much money to fix it? 
uh, that kind of stuff. So it's, his name is Tim Faust or Timothy Faust. And he has a little video that I can put in the show notes called what is health justice. And he talks about the, just basically the philosophical argument for taking care of your citizens and just the economical argument too, just because it's just the most efficient thing to do. Uh, even if your politics don't align with that. That's it. That's my picks. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show today. Uh, a lot of great talks. Yeah, it was awesome. This right. was a lot we'll of fun. Young Bye. <laughs> Bye. See you. Bye. Yay. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.